It always does that. Um, production, we created a model rain garden. I'm anxious to hear more. Please help me welcome, welcome Janet and Kilgore.
intercept the rain the raindrops um, in 30 to 40 percent of the uh, rain water is actually taken up by by trees and, and plants and it, it goes into the, the um, air and so there's a, there's a description there of seasonal changes what happens during summer and then winter is it possible to, to read that? Maybe things are not clear enough to read that to you. During the winter months, there is more um, evaporation than, trans than, than transpiration. Um, so it's not so much that the leaves or needles are um, give, giving off the um, water, but it would go directly into the, into the atmosphere and in exchanging with um, Cloud cover, and that's 40 to 50 percent during the uh, forest conditions. There's, all, there's less than one percent of surface runoff, which is a very small amount. 20 to 30 percent of the rainfall in the forest condition is going into the top the top soil, which is called the interflow. And then 10 to 40% is going into groundwater. After development, there is a significantly less plant and, and soil that is exposed. There's a lot of rooftops, driveways, concrete, and the water flows quickly off of those surfaces. In this, in this uh, Estimate it's 20 to 30 percent, which is running directly off those surfaces. And if you think of cities like Birmingham or any um, developed area, we have houses that are quite large and yards that are quite small. So you might be having more than half of the area not be pervious, and there's that runoff having, happening immediately. There might be nothing going into the top zone, zero up to 30 percent. And then only 10 to 20 percent is filtering into groundwater. So, uh, based on the level of development in, in our area, the ecology has uh, decided that we should use low low impact development, and that's called um, LID, low impact development. And that is a, it's a mix of strategies. Developers um, and, meet, and anyone actually building over um, 2,500 square feet uh, of an addition or uh, driveway would, um, be, would need to follow these, these guidelines. And they are to create rain gardens or bio re retention facilities. Um, also, pervious pavement, uh, which could be concrete or Asphalt, for, uh, for, I think for the, for the small scale project, concrete pavers are actually the, the best. And um, I just learned that that sand, when we, we, we often set pavers in, into sand, that's the, the old way, but for, for this method, um, gravel of, of very specific sizes, rock and small gravel are, are, are used underneath the pervious concrete pavers. And if sand is uh, mixed in there, that it can eventually clog. So here we're, we're looking at all the benefits of healthy soils. There is a coarse cover to so that those raindrops are not hitting with, with such force on, onto bare soil. They're, um, they're, the plants are, are taking up and, and using that water. And there's a filtering action that happens in, in soil. You know, when the soil accepts the groundwater and has time for it to, to, to percolate slowly through that healthy soil, there's life in there, and the, the soil life can actually break down the uh, petroleum products that might, might be washing in. Um, if there's nettles, they can 
they found, they found that with, with, the, with the courteous pavement, there, there were biofilms on, on those gravel pieces that can also perform action. That's, being, that, that, that's also being studied now. And um, you can, I can talk more about the resources and studies that you can, you can look up. There's, there's plenty of information on, online that you can get more detail on these studies. And so when the water is stored in the soil, plants can then take it up and, and make, make use of it during periods that are not, not rainy. And that, and that means that there's less need to water, less need to pump water out of, out of, out of Lake Whatcom to be able to water our gardens. And um, there's less, the, if, there, if the soil is healthy, then plants are healthy. Or pesticides to fight pest issues. I should mention that with rain gardens, um, there is it is never a, a appropriate to use her herbicides because um, then they, they do interfere with the life of the soil, and um, we also don't need to water them once the plants get established. This is information from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which was founded in, um, after the Dust Bowl, when there was a continent with the practices of tilling and um, standard modern ag agriculture, that the, the land was being blown away. And washing away into the um, so that they were, they were losing topsoil at such an alarming rate that the soil was, was, was declared a, a natural resource. In fact, on, on their website, they state that soil is a living and life giving natural resource. So, there are three kinds of effects that can happen to soil, three, three ways that we can interact with, with soil that can be that can have damaging effects. So the first is the, the physical interaction. Um, when vehicles drive on, on soil, particularly when, when it's wet, they can contact down to 24 inches. That's what that graphic is showing me in that study. And they found that the tires are less inflated or their um, the tractors have the, the tracks so that spread out that force that there is a Less of, less of a compaction than if the tires are pumped up fully and, and they're um, but and of course this it, you would normally just drive once often with construction and delivery of materials there's constant driving of traffic which would have a long term effect on the on this, this slow structure and of course breaking the soil that's what we, we say when we're going to make cars we say we're going to break the soil it does actually break it. Unfortunately, it has a structure that's created by the action of the movement of uh, microbes, uh, the, the macro uh, life of, of that soil that glues the soil together and also creates tunnels, which, which allow water to run through. And um, that is a, um, it can be easily destroyed when, and when the soil is or levels of the soil have been shifted. If you go dig down deep and take that lower soil and put it higher up, it um, changes everything for that like that kind of soil. And there's a bi biological component. Um, I, I keep chickens, and I'm very aware of how much they can they can change the uh, soil. Uh, and I have to add a lot of straw in areas where they've been running because that helps to, helps to balance that nitrogen with some carbon. And um, another issue in the city, I know for folks who work at the park and have to go around with, uh, you know, dealing with, with dog waste, it's, it's a, you know, that, that's a significant um, waste uh, source that, is, that can be 
mitigated somewhat by plants and soil. And then of course there are chemicals, uh, also altered it, so we have to see where there's talk about when we need chemicals. So that, that, that life of the soil feeds on all the different aspects of, of plants, and all the different parts of the plants. The um, green parts of it are uh, heat quickly, and the structures, this, this picture shows how this leaf has been part, part way degraded, and it shows the skeleton of, of the leaf. Those the lignans are broken down slowly by fungi after the bacterial action has taken place. And roots of the soil as they're breaking down also um, open up soil and provide those tunnels that I was talking about. So the, that fung fungal action is actually very critical to woody plants. And most, for the most part, my gardens are, and many of the gardens that we plant for, for permanent landscaping are dependent on fungal relationships. The, the, the um, microbial relationships. So the, um, that balance should not be upset by adding compost that's high in nitrogen. Um, Today, with, with animal manures, it's a completely different uh, animal. This is made, it doesn't um, provide the same kind of uh, pH uh, which, um, and um, material that, that the soil life needs for a woody plant, plant community. But we, you know, it, it's good to always have a diverse very much in favor of, layer, of layering landscapes, planting both annuals, perennials, shrubs, and trees. This graphic shows how deep roots can actually go. There's a little, little simple onion, and it's reaching down to three, three feet. Okay, it has a fibrous root system. And so, uh, Trees, when you're working around trees, you'll find that some of them are fibrous and are very difficult to dig around. And some of them have uh, are more, have more seeking roots there, and uh, they extend very far from the, the crown. So that's all that needs to be carefully managed when you're working with soil. And this is why we, we use mulch. Mulch has many benefits. Um, I'm in favor of mulch that will break down into uh, something that can feed plants and, and feed soil life. It's actually that soil life that is able to provide food for, for the plants. There's a cycle going on there. It's really complicated um, and it's fun to study. There is a, um, a couple of books that I recommend highly. It's uh, teeming with microbes and teeming with nutrients. And Jeff Lowenfeld is the author of, of, of those two titles, and they're great books that go into great detail with a lot of science, but very accessible and clear, clear, clearly written. So it's a good way to spend your winter. You can study those for many months. Can you give that name again? Yes. The, the, the two titles are Teeming with Microbes, and teeming with nutrients. It's written from a gardener's perspective. And he, he is a scientist, but he's offering uh, both the, the knowledge of, of uh, what what the, the interactions are, and what the, the life is in the, in the soil web. And he's all, and he most clearly written, because it's a, for, for me, that's a very complicated topic. There's a lot of chemistry in there, as well as, um, biology and the whole ecosystem. So um, I just think he's a very clear writer and he's easy to understand. Sure. Um, what's the name? Uh, okay. At least the first one is a very small book. Oh. You can get through it, um, it's very thin. Yeah. Okay. You really get through it in a couple hours. So I encourage you to get it at the library. It's very oh, okay. Well, I guess he's written a more of a fuller version because mine is a, is a full book. It's about 250 pages. 
Yeah. Yeah. And the, the author's name is Jeff Lowenfels. It's um, L O E N F E L S. There might be a W in there. I'm not, I'm not sure about that.
question. Okay. Um, not clear to me about what you, how you manage the slope into your basement. What I did on the, the right side of this photo, there is a, um, tre a trellis structure, which is next. It is built onto, onto my house. It's, a, it's, a, it's an arbor, in, in effect. And, the, and within the, the beams of the, at the, the top of that arbor, I've set my um, drainage channel. So the, the downspout go, goes into a, a gutter that is high up. It's, it's, it's overhead, and then the water and travel down from that into the, the rain garden so that the water is entering now where it, 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 it used to be coming from a downspout and, and dumping right right next to my building. But now it's, it's coming down 10, 10 feet away. And I, I dug a, uh, a rain garden at that, at that 10, 10 foot distance from my house. Because that's a, a safe distance if you have a crawl space or a basement. You don't want your deer to be right next to the house because you're not so you don't want to soak in water that, that close to any structures. So I'm conveying the water to the a, a distance 10 feet from the house. And that is, is um, beyond a burn. So the water, when it's trying to flow back toward my house, it's it's blocked by that burn that runs, runs parallel to, to, to the house. So the trellis, um, the water courses along the trellis, or there's actually a, a pipe, like a gutter pipe, on the trellis itself? Yeah, the, the, the water passes through a gutter that is built in, into the trellis. So that conveys it to a, a distance from the house, and then it goes through a downspout. So it, it, it comes down to ground level. And there's also really beautiful ways to do this with, with rain chains, where you can have a, a landscape feature that is really beautiful. It has a lot of uh, sound as well. And, you know, there's thinking of beautiful interest in, in the garden. Does that make it more, more clear about how? Oh, but it, yeah, if I had drawings, it would be easier for you to see. But, And so 
after, so this, this soil had to be removed, and what I did was mound it up here, so that the new, the new slope is, is a, a, a mound that goes like this. And then it's depressed again over, over here. So when the water is coming through here, the, the force of it is broken up by rocks, and then it flows down into the rain garden. And there's a lot of plants in here that are helping to soak up the water as it flows this way. And it's going, this, this channel is, is actually more of a, of a swell because it's a, it's a, a long, narrow depression. And it, the water then flows away from my house and goes into a, a separate area that's a, a different rain garden. So this is, is a bit exaggerated, but it's sunken down over time, and the neighbors land a little bit higher. So I'm dealing with their rainwater coming in this way, too, that's shooting off that surface. And then it's going down into the soil. And there's plants in here, lots of plants all over that help to filter that, that um, rainwater. Does that make more sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, Thank you. Really Did you um, put planting against the house? Or did you keep that for No, because but I, I, don't, I generally don't do that because I find it's really hard like, to clean out gutters and to paint and you know to, to do anything and to also walk around houses. Most most houses or many of the houses in, in Bellingham have um, pathways that are right next to the house because many people are close together and you know to, to, to get around your structure you want to walk close to, to the house. It's just it's not a great place to put plants. I'm finding that the plants are planted too too close to the house. It's, um, it doesn't really uh, work very well. We can go back to the, the, the first slide that actually shows this in the, uh, if you, you, you remember that first slide, it shows if you're standing on, on, on the other side of this trellis and looking that way, you can see, see, see the path and the green garden going up there. So this is not, there are no fill plants here, and there, isn't, there are some vines that are growing up here now. And um, there's lots of, there's like, some bigger trees that are already here. So there's a lot of cover. Have you got water in the basement now? Nope. No. no more water in the basement. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there hasn't been water in, in, our, in my basement for the last couple of years. Um, in very extreme events. There, there's actually a, a, a drain in, in Set into the basement floor because it's been, I'm sure, it was an on, ongoing issue when they decided when they put the house there, they knew it was going to be an, an issue. So I can tell when there's water just at that level of, of the drain that it never comes up anymore. Any other, any other questions about that? Mm -hmm. We're going to get more into design and construction that will cover some of these points. So we'll just a little bit more about soil. I know it seems, seems repetitious or maybe not so, so, so interesting, but it's really important. Um, when you're designing rain, rain gardens, you have to figure out what the drainage capacity of that soil is. If, again, the, the, the water has, has to go in. It's not going to just sit on the surface. This is a, a triangle uh, showing soil texture, I'm sure. Everyone here has seen that before, and um, that's the, the first step in, um, in looking at soil is figuring out the, the sand, clay, and silt content. And you probably all done jar, jar tests where you take the soil and put it in a, a jar of water and shake it and let it settle out. You can learn a lot from that. But if you want to try that, just look on, online and find out more step-by-step more, uh, -step in, information about that. There's still a, a lot of confusion about what's the best soil for rain gardens. The, um, the, there are some studies that are on, ongoing now through, through WSU, the, the Washington Stormwater Center, and most of them. They are um, finding out that um, perhaps a, a better mix has larger pieces of wood. Of more, it's more similar to mulch than. Um, Compost. 
or at least has some a, a larger component. Um, there, um, well, that it, uh, there is something that used for actual mulching that is similar to what they call hog, hog fuel. That would be arborist chips. Um, when they, all of the, the trimmings that, that would include uh, leaves and sticks, and um, or when they're chopped up and ground. It's basically if you if you made a huge pile that was like that, and you let it sit for a couple of years, you have perfect perfect material to to amend your uh, your green garden soil because it's got all the, the, the life that you want, all the, the fungal and bac 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 bacterial organisms that are being present already. It's not a sterile mix like you often have often end up getting when you buy soil. And uh, you know, it would smell like the, the forest floor, which that's basically what, what it is. But it should never smell like ammonia, it shouldn't get hot when it's when it, when it gets wet. So it would be, be a very stable uh, comp compost and it would be based on forest products. So some of that can be mixed into the top of the soil. Sand is often used. Uh, and so these numbers are not very firm. They're, they're changing all, all the time. And um, so the, the, the lower uh, part there that says rain garden soil mix is similar to the, what they call bio re, re, retention mix. It's what um, is purchased and if you're going to take out all of the native soil. But with, with, with rain garden design, we don't have to take away native soil. We can just amend it. And so the Pro proportions of sand and compost and native soil are somewhat variable depending on site. And of course the, the, the soils from site to site can vary dramatically. And we're, we're talking about a nice thick layer of this stuff. It's you know, at least 12 inches and it can be up to 24 inches. Do pit tests or kind of in, infiltration test, I think it's called, is um, a way of uh, figuring out what the, the drainage capacity of the native soil is. And uh, often the rain garden handbook, it goes into depth, and that, that's available on, online. So it's a, called the rain garden handbook for Western Washington. And then figuring out the slope of, of a site really handy to have one of these laser levels. My uh, inspiration for garden design always comes from, from nature. That's how I, I, I learn what works well and I also use a general garden design uh, thinking. And this, I found this book by Joe Beck to be really helpful. It's a very slim volume and it goes into all of these parts of uh, or elements of garden design is what it's called. So our, when we look at our in, intention, which is to mimic forest conditions, we have to look at our site and the surrounding area to figure out what's going on in a, in a broader area. It could be um, that in several houses or a whole block in the, in, in the neighborhood have a watershed uh, function happening. And we all have our own style. So some people like very neat kind of gardens, and that is perfectly possible with a rain garden. Uh, often they have a, a, a wild look because native plants might do that, but there aren't, aren't native plants that stay small and, and tidy and wouldn't be pretty. So you want to find the right plants that fit your, your style and your site. That is what is recommended because of uh, the fact that they can deal with both the wet conditions and the summer drought. Um, some, you, you, if you, if, when you're thinking about planting something, just research what its native conditions are, and you can find out what it what it likes. And with garden varieties, the more uh, cultivated plants. Um, it's harder to, to tell. Some, some of them are more wide, widely uh, 
stacked it and it can't be suitable for rainbow birds and uh, some just are too difficult. They, they, they want you to water them during summer and that, that doesn't work because that, that would, would overload the, rain, the functioning of the rain garden. And some of them need chemicals and we don't want to add any chemicals. So we just stick with the natives or other plants that we know will, will work. You can, you can try different things. I've, I've used a lot of species. Um, I have a species rhododendron. That's doing very well. It's a slower growing form, you know, so that it will stay the, the, the size that they want to be. Structure also includes the um, what we're going to go into next, which is all of the parts of the, the rain garden to be able to move water. And um, we do need to think about access as with my path that I wanted to, to move around my house and have the water going across the path or go over the top. There are some really beautiful designs if you go if you're on Pinterest and uh, type in uh, stormwater. Uh, you will get lots of photos of um, really beautiful designs. Like you can spend many, many hours looking into that. And the, the scale is really important. You know, the plants don't overgrow the, the space that they have. All those, all those elements of art, the contrast, the For me, I don't know why exactly, but this photo, which I took out of uh, Lake, Lake Watkins Park, it's, it just looks perfect. I'm not sure why. It is that, that's the, the kind of thing that, you know, you, you're looking for that kind of perfection of balance and harmony, and um, it's really hard to define or make it um, a set thing. It's just you can move things around until you get them the way you want them. And now we're going to talk about those green garden structures. We have conveyance, which is moving water. And I really like this design from the North, it's from the North Cascades Institute, where they do work both a lot of rain and snow. And to me, this makes perfect sense because you don't, you don't have to get up on a ladder to clean it out if there are any leaves in there. And it also becomes a very beautiful landscape feature. Basically, moving water off the roof and into the channels that can flow into the gardens. Another way to do that is um, with a, um, a line channel. And I, as part of my model that it's just going to be there for another couple, another week or so until they close up. But um, this shows that the, the, a piece of pond liner is, is lining up a, a ditch, basically, and it's, it's, um, has uh, rocks in it for so, so me to, to, to cover it and, and hold it down. And uh, it's accepting water from a, from a roof and moving it away from, from the structure that's that the land. And that, that also is a way to, to protect plants that might already be there, like this pine, that may not like to have so much water. And um, also you have a space to be able to plant rock, rock water plants and have a, a, a drought tolerant garden if you want that. Curb cuts are used um, in, in rain gardens that are next to the street, and that's something that, of course, you need to talk to the city about if you're thinking about or Rocker County, they're thinking about cutting into the curb, but it's a way to accept um, rainwater from the, from the um, street in, in some cases. And in this example, it's actually the overflow of the, the rain garden that's higher up. And rocks are always uh, what's usually used to slow down the, the course of water. So that would prevent erosion. There is a rain garden above that curb cut and so there, when the rain garden is um, full, basically if there's been a, a very large storm and there's a more water coming into the rain garden than it can, can store or filter, then it, um, it Flows out into a point, so that's one of one of the elements of the, the rain garden design is to design for inflow and out outflow. Mm -hmm. You can see a larger example of that behind City Hall in the parking lot. Oh, yeah. The parking, the water flows into the rain garden, but if it's too much of the rain garden, there's a place that can go into a storm drain. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have pool yes. in the yeah. parking lot. Yeah, there is an example of a very quite old rain, rain garden in the back of City Hall and you always have to plan for the, 
the overflow because they were probably will happen at some point. Here's a different example of um, sheet out, out, outflow. It's just going over a an area of the, the garden, kind of with, with ground covers. One um, challenge with this is that if the water just flows over the, the sidewalk, that in um, icy icy conditions, that could be dangerous. So we can think about that too. It's not the best. But I'm not sure that there is a, a sidewalk in this example. These, oh, go ahead. Um, if you have just a slide, just say so. But um, with warming and the growth um, zones becoming ever warmer and warmer, mm -hmm. and mosquitoes, yellow fever, malaria, etc., becoming concerned, are people expressing any concern about having these? basically stuck on growing um, mosquito larvae, etc. Well, the, the, the question is about mosquitoes, and um, the rain gardens should not hold cold water for the length of time that we um, so right. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're faster draining. That's, that's part of what you're doing when you're bringing <coughs> the forest soil mix. We're ensuring that the water is, that the, the water level is not going to stay above um, ground it's gonna it's gonna sink down and be below grade and that will allow the little keep mosquitoes from hatching in it. So with that example of the um, if you were looking at that stormwater planter and that is an, an engineered design. The um, and the one that we learned about in, uh, in the LED training, they had a porous uh, concrete and porous sidewalk as well, so, so that the street and the sidewalk were both had large reservoirs of gravel underneath them. And so a, a, a stormwater planter like this is able to sink its volume into those areas. So that's definitely an engineering feat there. So when we first came out with the previous um, concrete and previous asphalt, they were recommending um, vacuuming it a couple times a year because of small particulates getting in between. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you've had a little more recent <laughs> introduction to it. Is that any solutions to that? Well, so it's a good thing to, to, to think about. I'm sure there are ways, there, there could be ways to filter the um, sediment prior to, have it, to it moving into the facility and that would, that would take care of some of the problems. Um, part, part of what they're recommending now is a, a, a coarser mulch with, with few, and, a, and, a, and a, 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 a sand that has fewer fines. There's less um, fine particles that uh, wash out. It's basically everything's getting bigger and coarser so that it functions better. <coughs> but you're talking about the surfaces in it. Like on the sidewalk, yeah, you know, yeah even right. parking lots. Yeah, some some of the earlier, I don't know if they've ever used sand per se, but they just they have gone to a, a, a larger particle gravel. Yes, both so both, both, both both underneath, and then looking at what what flows into it. If you're going in with a fine bark mulch along the, the edge, then that's going to allow sediment. Yeah, it's going to allow sediment to go in. So you need to think about that kind of thing. Beauty bar is never recommended. <laughs> they really make stress that in case you were wondering. It's not okay. Here's a <coughs> graphic showing um, working with slopes and creating burns. I think that makes it a, a little bit more clear about moving soil. I, I don't see the, the point of taking soil away. I just figure that you need it. And so I, I usually create burns uh, and I move the soil if I put it somewhere where it's going to be helpful and to direct the, the flow of water. And it also creates microclimates. Uh, those burns can be uh, fast draining 
uh, in, in, in a sunny area and can uh, support uh, drug tolerant plants that you would be able to grow, grow elsewhere. So this is a nice mix of garden uh, soil conditions. There's a, a green garden that's, that's gr grown up a bit, and so you can see how the, the vegetation completely covers the surface of it. And, uh, it looks like it's, it's accepting water from the, from the street as part of the uh, overall design in, uh, in Seattle. When you have multiple sections of the rain garden, you can have these, uh, I think the previous slide or the next slide where it shows the urban dams, which is one, one way of slowing down the flow of water when, when there's multiple rain gardens or a, a large rain garden set up on a, on a slope.
want to eat foods that are in your car and you could, uh, you know, you could go for birds perhaps. <laughs> but it's, it, is, it isn't recommended to have your, your edible plants within the rain garden itself. But it, it's a great way to filter the rainwater so that you can have edible gardens below your, your, rain, your rain garden. So that it's, after the water has soaked through soil, you can eat uh, your edible plants. Miracle California is a great town. Uh, it's a uh, the Pacific Black Swan Hill is just a really neat and um, it's a shrub that can grow either in wet or in dry conditions, um, sun or some shade as well, and um, it's a good one for the city. Nice glossy green leaves. And then um, tall Oregon grape is what's pictured here. It's a beautiful plant. Um, I just love the way all those glossy leaves look during winter when they um, get wet. But there are possibilities of planting not not natives also, uh, and that's kind of what I'm doing in my yard is to trial a lot of different varieties. That when I read about them, and they say uh, tough plant grows anywhere. And, you know, and some of them like, you know, don't find other ones that say don't don't plant this; it'll spread and take take over everything. You know, then I, I trial them, and uh, I really actually I think that I found out that this plant is actually called uh, the one on the right is. Heliagnus uh, punchins, Maculata. And uh, for me, this one that we're going to come to that is a um, really useful shrub for the Zen one because it is tolerant of very wet and dry conditions and also um, has beautiful uh, flowers. It's a group of the birds we eat if you can. Conifers, are, of course, have their, their needles during winter, and so they uh, are really useful for rain gardens. We're getting close to the time that we have we have a lot of questions, so is it okay if I run through this more, more quickly? And uh, yes. if you want to look at the names on my website, I'm going to post this on, on my website also, wonderfulflora.com. So we've got all the usual suspects for the, for the wet areas, the willow and red and yellow to the goblin. But again, they can, they can grow much larger than you want them. So for a small rain mark, you want to carefully place them or put four varieties.
is, is a hybrid or a selection from the native. And grasses uh, often are, are, are used in the zone one area. And they, uh, again, they can be the, the, the natives, they come in many different forms, uh, different planting heights and different textures, and then also the fancy garden ones. Some sort of animals or some like this. So they are a lesser used kind of, um, uh, of garden um, planting. And, and I, I really find it useful when, you're, when the garden is new and the plants are a little bit further apart and you want to cover ground quickly. These are, are some um, ones that are native to western mountains. And um, both the, uh, the, the Nancy Douglas side and the uh, Nancy so plate. The Tonya Sciatherica are, uh, are uh, native to rural pools. So creating the shade for some of these plants up on the zone of three, mm. would you want to group the taller things together and kind of have that forest canopy sure. created? Yeah, definitely. So the grouping, or do you want to like set the bigger, let's say, um, depends on, on your. Cedar? On your site, yes, cedar is a great one if you have space for it or use a smaller form. And yes, def definitely you can create shade if you want to have shade plants. Um, Can I grow them all around the rainbow or on the side where it's out facing? <coughs> or group them? Like you group the trees? Yeah, there, there, are, there, are, there are double shade and, and, and some living plants, so it's just it's worthwhile doing, 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 doing research and then. It's totally dependent on your site as to where, where you put them. Um, where you have cash shade and trees. It's just, it's a, it's a site by site. Creating that
And uh, so what I've been able to do is supply seed to these growers and then buy plants back so we don't do any propagation, which is kind of a good thing because a lot of the seed growers, or a lot of the seed suppliers also grow plants. So if you're a nursery and you're buying seed from another nursery, you kind of wonder what seed you're getting. Are you getting the A grade seed or the B grade seed or the right seed or the wrong seed? So uh, this little niche has worked out really well for us. Um, uh, so we did that for about the first uh, 10 years of the of our company, um, and I built houses along with that too, so I have kind of construction background too, but um, during that time, uh, I was getting an environmental education degree at Western, and uh, started doing curriculum work for environmental education around wetlands, and that kind of launched me into the whole wetland science thing. And since then, um, done a fair amount of consulting and collaboration with engineers on wetlands and city um, stormwater projects, and so basically anything around native plants is kind of what I've been able to get my hands into over the last 20 years. Um, also including like very sophisticated engineered wetland systems that process all the septic water from 100 degree dorms and environmental learning centers and really innovative projects like that. So uh, I have lots of experience using these plants in small and big projects. And uh, what would happen is we'd have these big projects and then I'd end up with a bunch of extra plants. So my yard quickly filled up with plants. That became kind of, you know, unwieldy, full of weeds or, you know, not shaped well. Um, so our mission for Plant Sativa has always been to promote native plants. And so to that end, we started a small retail operation just on weekends, actually a couple blocks from here in the back of a convenience store that sold mostly cheap cigarettes and booze. <laughs> and it turned out that there was really very little crossover between them. <laughs> uh, um, but it was a good start. It was right next to my house, and I made a, a gate through the fence so I could just go over there. I would basically clean seed all day while I was waiting for customers to come in. And uh, surprisingly, a lot of customers, even though there were very few then, are still my main, you know, clientele. So the people that use native plants are, are pretty passionate about it, and people actually seek us out because they're pretty hard to find at the retail level if you want one or two or five and not 500. So, um, like I said, our mission is to promote native plants, and so now we're located on State Street, a couple blocks south of the Herald Building. Um, who knows where our nursery is? Yeah, all right. <laughs> I won't bore you with that. It's a couple. Yeah, the mysterious place that looks like it may never be open for it. <laughs> so our, our hours are uh, Thursdays from uh, 12 to 5 and Saturdays from 10 to 3. And the reason we have limited hours is because if we try to staff it every day, we have to probably double or triple our prices. So we're also open anytime by appointment if those hours don't work for you. And since our hours are kind of weird, we try really hard to accommodate everybody's schedule. So um, please don't, if you ever are curious and want to come see what we're doing, don't hesitate to make it uh, because we're there a lot anyway. So that's, that's enough about that. Um, so what, uh, what I've been doing in the talks I've been doing, instead of bringing a PowerPoint and just kind of talking to people, I like to just kind of get a little bit of background and then open up the floor to people's questions and kind of have a discussion about how to maybe, you know, prepare soils or abate weeds or deal with rain gardens or the process or, you know, not weed or blackberry or whatever. And we, um, we've had a lot of experience trying to, you know, fight these weeds that take over everything. And uh, the other thing I want to say is I'm pretty passionate and pretty biased toward using native plants, but I don't really like to tell people what to do. So what I like to do is put all these biases out on the table and then make it work for the client, or for you guys in this case. So, um, you know, if you want to have blueberries in with your salal, or have, you know, uh, a magnolia tree in the middle of all your, you know, whatever, that's, that's fine with me. I just, I'm here to help with uh, my experience, and if you have questions, I'd love to answer them. Or even, even uh, stories of your own about things that didn't work, and that we could share with everybody in the room here. So, um, with that, I can keep talking all day about myself, or we could uh... <laughs> no Okay. Um, so one of the big things that I've been really interested in is various treatments of stormwater. The idea of stormwater having non-point and point pollution. And I keep hearing, yeah, you know, have this rain garden, we'll clean it all up, blah, 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 blah. But do you know what you can do? 
don't take me literally when I say rain garden or infiltration trench. It's just the idea of either allowing the water to perk into the soil or to have it de detained and slowed down is really the idea. And what these were doing is they were all going, everything was going over the curb, into the stream, straight into the storm basin, and fast track right into the storm water. Where is the um, I think it, it has the potential to, but one of the problems with permeable pavement is it'll clog up. So, like, uh, is, it, is anybody familiar with the project they did on Silver Beach? Um, where, so what they did was they, there's a residential street that goes along Lake Wacom, and they took the shoulders and they made them permeable, uh, permeable concrete, I think it was in that one, right? Yeah, okay. And, uh, I've noticed that every once a year at least they take the city, they take a, a pressure washer and then they have that big vacuum truck and they're actually cleaning out the permeable concrete because once it fills up, the water just sheds just like anything else. So once again, it's kind of like maintenance and, and planning for maintenance and making sure that if you know you can have sediment moving, have it move somewhere where you can clean it out before it becomes a problem and, and monitor it too for that. Does that make sense? Answer your question? Okay, great. Sure. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you have a compiled list of, of native plants that are, are deer tolerant. You know? <laughs> 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 well, there's a lot of lists like that. Um, a whole bunch of lists like that. <laughs>
the person that really wants to do it at this point. But as water rates go up and water supplies go down and maintenance, um, you know, like Vancouver, BC, no roundup, not allowed to use it. Because they found with an independent, impartial, you know, board that they don't want to have the long-term effects of roundup. Well, what does that mean? that you have to weed torch or take, get your screwdriver out and go into your gravel driveway and get every little damage line out, you know, but this is kind of where we're going is more of a practical, long-term approach. Let your yard be a jungle, you know, and then the, the deer, you probably won't notice. <laughs> um, yes? I have a list of some smaller dwarf native plants that are native to the um, well, native, native stuff is what it is. Uh, everything that's made is kind of a hybrid, or I would consider native. Um, but uh, the King County Natural Resources um, website has an awesome tool for this, where you can choose, and they have a list of all, you know, quite a few native plants, 150 or so, and you can choose height. You can, so they'll give you all the plants that stay under two feet. And then you and then you can look them up plant by plant and see which ones like moist shade, like hot sun. Um, and it's a great resource, and you can get there by going to my website. Um, and I highly recommend using that because it will just give you a list of 15 or 20 plants that meet the exact criteria you're looking for. What's the name of that? It's the uh, King County Natural Resources. Oh, yeah. Do you use that one? Right? Yeah, and uh, there's a couple. Um, there's also the and star something and they often photograph Star Flower Foundation. Star Foundation yeah. done a nice job. Yeah. Star Flower Foundation. We did a bunch of work for the Star Flower Foundation in Seattle City Parks. Um, and I can tell you a whole bunch about that organization. It's awesome. Or I can answer some questions. <laughs> the other thing I would say is I don't know how many of you are urban, but cool thing to look up online is the uh, Pollinators Pathway. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It goes from the university, Seattle University, to a Seattle City Park. And it's just a parking strip, and they planted native and non-native pollinators to try and move the pollinators between. Um, uh, <coughs> I was say this, the campus, which is using no pesticides or herbicides of any kind, to a park that has been been. and so it's a volunteer park. I can't remember. Is it volunteer? I don't want to get on the other end, I never get that far. <laughs> yeah. it is, it's incredible just to see what, you know, a bunch of homeowners all working together did. Yes. And I think that kind of is the big, kind of the big kicker is like, when you, you know, you never know if you, when you plant a native plant, where that seed is going to go, what bird is going to grab it, and, and it's just these ripples that you're making that you can feel pretty good about, you know, rather than maybe ripples that are not doing good for the, you know, surrounding community. Um, she's been waiting very patiently. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Um, when you were talking about landscaping, green green gardening, we had, I don't know if you know Sue Taylor and her green gardening club. Yes. I can't recommend it enough to absolutely anybody here, mm -hmm. which was the heart of our master gardening program. But my problem, and I told this to Sue, to her face, one problem with the course I have is when we visit various people's homes, it seems like a riot. I, I'm enough of a sort of bourbon snob that I want my native landscape to complement the house and the house to complement the, um, my new forest growing. Is there anybody in town, perhaps you, who designs a forest so it complements back and forth? Yes, absolutely. Probably Sue is probably the best at it. She's a designer. Yes. I, didn't know I just worked with her on a lawn removal and we just did exactly what you're talking about. Where, uh, so, um, and I've done a lot of that work too, and my, my goal would be to figure out exactly what you want. Um, when I, before I got the nursery, I was, um, I did some consulting with some landscape architects that wanted to infuse native plants into their plants. And so, they would give me their plans that had, you know, the typical juniper and, uh, you know, piece of root room and all this other stuff. And, uh, and then they'd ask me to find analogs that were native that would meet the same niche. And it was actually pretty easy. There isn't the diversity of options that you have in the horticulture world when you're working with natives, especially in Western Washington. Um, but uh, they do exist, and so you know, you could. Um, I've done that before, where I've shown up and 
you know, people wanted me to install their plan that they got from the landscape architect, but they didn't really like the plan. But I was, it was, it's pretty easy to, you know, just, you know, add, you know, figure out what's native that meets that same niche as the horticultural variety. And, uh, and then, you know, um, I think the main mistake people make with landscaping with native plants is they um, either plant them too close to sidewalks or buildings, or they plant things that are going to really aggressively spread. So, like, one from one is Nuka Rose. <laughs> and I, I mean, I've made this mistake myself where people were, um, I had friends, and I'm like, oh, look, I have all these extra roses. They're like, great. And then they lived in their house for 10 years and fought the Nuka Rose just like, every year because it's taking over their vegetable garden and everything and it'll jump the sidewalk and come up on the other side of the sidewalk. Very thorny, um, very aggressive. Um, and then, and so now they have a rental house and every couple of years they have to actually come in with a piece of equipment. <laughs> and then, so it's- These are former friends. <laughs> they live in New Zealand now. <laughs> But, uh, just, but that's a, I think that that's kind of where finally we're getting to the point, or at least I am personally, where I can kind of say, yeah, this looks a little raw, or it looks underplanted now, but in three years, it's going to be awesome. And so, you know, overplanting, I think, is probably one of the biggest problems we have with the native plants. It just turns into a jungle because the plants love it here. Um, yes? Would you recommend a rose for restoration project, though? Uh, yes. Okay. Sure, yeah. They're, they're real, the neighbors are mine, they're real worried about the jungle factor. Oh. We ordered a lot of the roads. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we have to get in and get out of the weeks. Yeah. yeah. We have to move into New Zealand in a few years. <laughs> well, if you don't want to have people in there, it's good. Like, if you don't or want dogs. people living in there, or dogs, or um, <laughs> if you have a, if you have an open, sunny environment, it's going to be really aggressive. If, you, if it's in an understory, you, it's a little bit more contained, just because it, it, it doesn't compete very well in the shade. Um, so nine bark doesn't spread. Rosa pisoparpa, which you often find with Nuka Rose, spreads much less aggressively and is much easier to contain. And it's very nice, yeah. Pisoparpa, yeah. Um, we really only have three native roses in Western Washington, so that's an easy one. <laughs>
gradual size. And, each, and so all these native wetland plants have a certain water depth that they can tolerate. And so they end up having communities based on water depth. It's the same when you have the upland and downland part. Like, uh, for instance, a river system has a river, and then along the edges of the river, it has a natural levee that's formed by flood debris. Usually that's rocky or well-drained. So right on the river bank, you might have salmon berry or something that likes moisture. But right on top of the natural levee and the well-drained, you have something more like nine water which doesn't occur down in the super saturated zone. So everything has a little niche. So once you go, so the more kind of, uh, the more diversity you can have in your planting areas, the more natives you can have. Yeah, and then, then if you don't have green canary grass, and you don't have knotweed or anything else like that, you can actually smother that stuff out. So with, uh, I wouldn't recommend weed cloth because Wood chips would be awesome, yeah. And even, even you know, a few layers of cardboard on top of those berms that you made with your spoils, and then the wood chips on top of that. And then I would recommend monitoring that for maybe a season or two. If it's a big area, I'd recommend two, because uh, the goal would be to make your maintenance curve go like this. So you could go plant out in the field now, and your maintenance curve will go like this. And you may never even see those plants. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We do a lot of work like that too. Yes. Um, I've been living in the forest for over 25 years, and in lieu of where the conversation was going with maintenance, I I have done my darndest to minimize my maintenance. But just this last week, I went out and just did a little bit of salal snipping. I mean. I'm, Got a lot of madrona, dug for cedar forest. And along the driveway that I look out to my kitchen window, there's a big madrona that has this big moss skirt, like a Christmas tree skirt, but it's this big, beautiful green moss. But I wasn't seeing it because it had this scraggly salal interspersed on it. And I just snipped out the salal, which means I'm going to have to go in and snip it out again. But for a little bit of maintenance, I'm going to see this most beautiful moss skirt out my kitchen window. So sometimes just a little bit of maintenance makes a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I work with a lot of people that they're, when we're sitting down at the table in the very beginning, they say, look, I want low maintenance. And it's like, okay. But compared to what? Yeah. Like, what do you have now? Okay, well, we have a lawn. Okay, well, so you're out there once a week, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that's, that's kind of the trick. If you really want no, low, low maintenance or no maintenance, it's really a forest. Is only, that's the only system I know that really has that. Um, or a wetland. Or something that's you're just allowing to go through its progression over a thousand years. You know? um, but... Your, your situation is exactly what I recommend to people, is that, you know, once or twice a year, go through with a metal blade weed whacker even, and just take it down, and, and you don't even have to haul the debris off if you do it, if you, if you break it up small, you can just leave it. Yes? You mentioned rhododendrons are native, but are hydrangeas native too? Our native hydrangea is, is mock orange, it's about as close as we have. And um, we have three native rodents that I know of. I have two at my nursery. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think that's as close as we have to native hydrangea. What colors are the natives that we have? Uh, we have the rhododendron macrophyllum, which is kind of it's pink, big flowers. And uh, if you ever been on Whidbey Island before Eby State Park? It's the native one that grows in the understory, very big. Um, it'll get ten feet tall. But uh, roadies take very well to being pruned back, and they they um, they re-sprout really well for that. Um, and then we have a deciduous one that's more of an azalea, uh, and it's white, kind of creamy white. Do you have any recommendations for northeast winter winds? What would we stand up to that and the evergreen? Out of the county? Yes. Um, I mean, uh, the tall Oregon grape definitely is, is super strong. The Oregon 
the taller you move, yeah. yeah. Um, it's pretty common, and so some yeah. people don't like it much. Found a place for it, but that's a good idea. Yeah. Put it over there. And that's kind of a really small set of plants in the native flora is evergreen shrubs. I know. So there's there's a California wax myrtle. There's um, the uh, Oregon grape. There's Salal. And then uh, and then there's Roby. And evergreen huckleberry, yeah. And evergreen huckleberry would actually be pretty tolerant of what you're doing too for the northeaster. And it'll take sun or shade also, so. Yeah, it's kind of a semi shady sunny location. Oh, that sounds perfect for evergreen huckleberry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a magic plant that's been, it's down to the spongy uh -huh. thing of the black locust, I think. Okay. And I've been putting a lot of uh, leaves and manure on it, and it seems to be breaking down. But it's out in the sun on the east side, getting a lot of hot sun in the summer. Mm -hmm. What would be a good plant made of voice to make a good plant in that? Because it's big and it's all kind of rotting now. How big would you want it to get? Oh, five or six feet would be fine. I'd like to block the view of my next door neighbor. I see. Mm -hmm. Or shorter, but. Does anybody have a, a solution to that? A recommendation? <laughs> I think so. The, the problem I'm having is there's probably like 25 things that you could have in that. Depends on where you can get water to it, easy. And if it's if it's spongy wood like that, it actually is pretty moist already. Yes. And if it's that big, that probably would be an issue once it's rooted. Um, but I mean, there, almost, there, anything, right? almost anything that will like full sun, you know. And like Ray, Ray mentioned ocean spray. Hazelnut. 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 Right. Yeah. So I've got some hazelnut already nearby. Hazelnut. Mountain mm -hmm. hemlock or Pacific hemlock. If you, if you yeah, wanted something that we can do. Oh, I don't want to really have towering trees next to the house. Let yeah. Live on them. It could be so many different things. Yeah. Okay. Great line. Uh, might be too silly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Irrigation, and the madronas are fine under irrigation. 
you know, right next to Karis and Nupta, you know. <laughs> so as long as they're above ground and well drained, they can take some water. But if they if there's any ponding, they're toast. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, I would like to uh, transplant some salal and deer fern from San Juan Island to my yard here in Bellingham. And I'm just wondering, is it better to get small ones or more established ones? And when is the best time to do that? Um, deer fern transplants pretty readily. Smaller is better. Um, Salau, different story. So you think something that is that strongly rhizominous, you could just take a little cutting into the root. No. Um, they're really, really hard. Like, I don't really know anybody that's been successful at it. Just, and the same with the low Oregon grape, same idea. Um, and you think about it, they're really, they grow in stable ecosystems. They're not a disturbed site. They're not something that pioneers areas that have had mass wasting or anything like that. So, um, those I usually ask people, just recommend people buy a four inch pot, which we have a ton of. We also have them up to two gallon size. But that's really, it's, I've seen that so many times. I just and have myself. unlimited salal field. You yeah. know, where, 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 where right. I just pick it up and pick it. But, you know, you almost never see a one little salal by itself as a true seedling. And I've looked for years and I've only found a couple. Yeah. Um, same with like Devil's Club and some other things like that. So, uh, if you put out some pots in that zone yeah. and let the seedlings create, yeah. I mean, you know, That's rain gutters, I mean, I live in the forest and my rain gutters fill up with all kinds of seedlings <laughs> yeah. if you don't clean them out. So lay down a rain gutter piece yeah. underneath your salal and you'll get seedlings. That's a great idea. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. <laughs> um, then, you know, slough seed, we collect it, and it is like a grain of sand. It's a little red grain of sand. And the first year seedling is like a quarter inch high. So they don't even grow it in seed beds because you can't weed it. You know? <laughs> it's impossible. So most of this seed, or the salal that is commercially raised is from a tissue culture. And so there's kind of laboratory situations where they grow 10,000 of these in these little vials. And the growers buy them for like 15 cents and they grow them on. And that's, that's a whole other side of the industry. So it produces that black berry. Right? Yeah. It produces, so couldn't you just plant the berry? Yeah. Um, once again, though, you have something that is, it's, it's, it, it's very hard for it to compete in an area where there's so much competition, you know, where there's all these other plants that grow really fast. And uh, salal is kind of funny. It grows. You can grow overhead in the shade, on a, you know, on a stump in a peat bog where it has access to some water, but it's really high and dry. But in the sun, it stays short. Uh, going back to the madrona, yeah. I know it's in such trouble. Probably you know, will be around for the next generation. Uh, I assume it needed salty air, salty soil, salty this and that. If I set up a rocky situation, could I grow Madrona in my backyard? Which yeah. has, which I'm in the most best soil on the world can. Um, yeah, sure. And you know, I mean, there's areas where it's so thick that people use them for firewood, and they're not coastal. Oh. Yeah. It's great firewood. It burns in your head. <laughs> <laughs> Why are they in trouble? Uh, the question is, why are the madrone in trouble? There's a fungus that's killing a lot of them. We have a, we're, when we moved into my nursery, there was a really nice, you know, 20 footer, and that never fruited and just looked beautiful, and then it started putting out all these berries, which were all hollow. So it was just clearly a stress on the tree. Um, and then gradually, you know, branches start to die, and now it's all hit. And, uh, you see a, a lot of the island right now, too. Some are resistant, I guess. We don't really know what's going to happen. Do you have a water system under it that was creating We didn't really change any of the conditions for it. And uh, some arborist friends have come by and diagnosed with that, that fungus. I can't remember what it's called. That is going around and killing them. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Reed canary grass? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. 
So, you know, there's been extensive studies by the Nature Conservancy uh, trying to uh, mow it, and when you mow it, it actually increases its tenderness. So it likes mowing. And the way it works is it's a, it uh, has pretty low viability from seed, but it creates some really, really intense root competition. So when you get a little patch of it, it just keeps growing and growing and taking over until it has a whole, you know, all the area you can get. Um, so digging it up isn't that great of an idea either. Um, like on a lot of commercial sites I've worked on, they have equipment, so they want to use it. So they bring in, they, they take all the saw every canary grass out. Well, now you're left with mineral soil. <laughs> all the good black soil is gone with the sod. And you probably still have the canary grass. So then, not only that, but it's all compacted with a 17,000 pound vibrating machine, you know. And we plant almost exclusively with a uh, two-stroke auger. I have five or six different sizes of bits, and they're 27 inch deep auger. So we try to decompact in place for each plant we plant and create a porous, uh, left up column of soil with all the soil horizons mixed together. And then, you, you know, so the plant immediately wants to root deeply, which gives it some drought tolerance. And some, sometimes it works really well because all the area around that's still compacted doesn't get very weedy very fast. And uh, these plants can move around. So to answer your question, the best thing I've seen is spraying. And if you spray correctly in the right time of year, which is usually in the fall or even right now, um, you can get you know 90 something percent kill. Um, the, so you, we usually mow it and then wait for it to come back to be about 18 inches tall, so you have lots of surface area on the leaves, and then spray it, and then usually cover it with wood chips too. And then the you know in the in the best conditions, then you monitor it for a year or two to make sure it's all gone. Well, it's been forming in this polar area, mm -hmm. but it's we're also in that chain of lakes. I mean, a pond. So okay. We can't, so I just yeah. kind of give up on that. And yeah. Um, a lot of people have given up on recanary grass and have decided that it's naturalized. Um, and the long-term restoration or revegetation point of view is to grow a forest in it and let it shade out. Mm -hmm. And that's really kind of the most cost-effective means to do it. The seed is really pretty low viability. It, it's not... Keep the goats in there and then oh, yeah. oh yeah, it sneaks, yeah. But um, I just ask everybody... So if it's a small area though, we've had pretty good success covering it with, you know, um, cardboard. And when I say cardboard, I'm usually talking about like appliance boxes right. that already are two or three layers of cardboard thick. I used to work at a cardboard factory, so I'm mm -hmm. not a cardboard expert. <laughs> and, uh, and on a hundred yard long machine that actually made cardboard. And so the appliance boxes and heavier things are actually two pieces of cardboard that are glued together with starch. So there's two pieces of card corrugated in there, maybe five or six pieces of paper. So it's heavy. And uh, when you're cardboarding, if you use small, like, mm, you know, like uh, produce boxes or small boxes, by the time you get the overlap done, you only have 20 to 40 percent coverage with your cardboard. So you need five times as much cardboard. But if you have a hundred square foot piece of cardboard, you end up with you know 50 or 60 feet of coverage with the overlap. So I've had clients that say, okay, we're gonna get the cardboard for the job. Yeah. And I get there and we start laying it down and we start flowing. And, but when we bring our cardboard in, we bring it in on a trailer and we put it out right where the truck's gonna dump and then we just move it around and just keep spreading from there. So that's a word of advice on cardboard. And for the re canary grass part of it, um, if you do a very thick layer of cardboard and you know six inches of wood chips on top of that, the, the re canary grass will come through, but it'll re root in that new horizon of, uh, of wood chips, and you can weed it from there. The other thing is, I got all the carpet from the source, and they were sold up sandwiched, but I, the neighborhood. Walking, mm -hmm. I don't know if that was the first there was. It's the part I really want to get rid of is right by the road, and then to that area I can manage. But mm -hmm. the garden. Huh? Come to the garden. Ah, yeah. So, so <laughs> you're. Can everybody hear
covering your... I can't do both. No. Okay. I can't do both. So she's suggesting covering your repainted grass with carpet. And I said the strip so I can put my, all the rows and my other one for the birds. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So that the water still gets out. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My um, bell just has been thinking for four years. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I kind of put cardboard or carpet in the kind of the, the weed cloth category, which to me is kind of a time bomb for maintenance down the road. Because the weeds will eventually root in it if you're not really on your maintenance. And the wood chips you put on top will turn to soil, and yay, you know, all this stuff will come right in. And uh, like quack grass, and then the next thing you know, you're following the quack grass through the carpet, or through the, through the carpet in this case, and then Everything roots in the carpet eventually. So, yeah. well, and then once it's there, okay. I'm not sure what's it in carpet. Yeah. It, would be, it, it would withstand the wind if I overlap it, right? And then the, the southeast, west wind can't catch it because it's not slow. And so, um, it would only be. Yeah. I would say if it was temporary use, it, it, it could be very effective. But it's free to fall over two sides. Yeah. But if it was there for very much longer than that, good luck getting it out. <laughs> I, have a, I have pictures of hauling carpet out of projects with a, and we made a, uh, like a cable choke chain like they use for logging. And we, you know, kind of gathered the carpet up and choked it and then drug it out with my truck. And uh, then it started unraveling. <laughs> and so we just had all these, you know, mile long, yarn everywhere, and then we started using the auger plant. And so it basically has the whole auger wrapped up, or the worst case in that is a buried barbed wire. And then you have this piece of barbed wire going around. Yeah, I would recommend carpet. After the uh, repeating air grass is solved, what do I do with my horse tail? Oh. We can scrub pots with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's great for compost. It's full of silica. Um, can you get it to stop from sprouting? Uh, you could enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, so my herbicide friends say that it's three years of diligent spraying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want my garden? Yeah. It's it's a so I've done like awesome lawn removal jobs with a. 275 gallon rain barrel that's all covered in cedar as part of the landscape and then it goes into this beautiful steel basin that I collaborated with my blacksmith friend and then it goes into a, a dry creek that's actually lined with clay so that when you open the rain barrel at a trickle it fills up this creek system and it runs while he's entertaining his, 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 uh, his friends um, and so we did like two or three layers of cardboard, it was a pretty wet site, we added drainage and everything from the whole property drains into an awesome rain garden and it works flawlessly. But I told him, I'm like, dude, you got a tie bob. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so, so most, most people, once they kind of understand that it's there, is they just pull it every couple, every, you know, twice, twice a season really, just go through and pull it and put it in the compost. There's another way to do it, a uh, landscape architect from Seattle. We're on a two acre estate on Lake Waco where everything is just perfectly manicured. And he wanted us to pull each horsetail up and to put two or three granules of casserole down each hole. Oh. Oh. That's a long lived uh, herbicide that they put under pavement and stuff. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we didn't do it. But that's kind of where people go with it, you know. And this is right on Lake Washington. So we're like, no, we're not doing that. So it's really, you know, it's an ancient plant, sporophyte. It's from the, you know, dinosaur era. And, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe you can explain. Uh, you've, you've used the word lawn removal several times, and I just found myself cringing. I'm curious with the lawn removal, with the idea of them growing forest, Green garden, and mm -hmm. that was why you were long removing. Is that correct? Um, green garden. I'm, uh, I'm not sure what, what specifially green garden is, but the okay. but it's just it's, two tailors. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Fine. Exactly. Um, yeah. And all her people that we visited, um, people showed us their green gardening lawns so there. They had moved them on, and I just cringed, thinking, well, why don't you put in the bushes and the trees? Maybe you know, 
give it some space so mulch so it can grow, and let the forest remove the lawn because, as I understand it, that's the brown gold in that lawn, the O and A horizon. It's like you're, strip, you're mind stripping, as far as I understand it. So I want you to explain to me why it's good. That is a great question. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, her 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 comment is about the you know efficiency or even maybe the the culture of lawn and, and lawn removal. Um, there are a lot of ways to remove lawns. The typical one people think of is like bring in a piece of equipment, remove the saw, haul it off, and then bring in soil. We don't do it like that. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay. Um, but that's, you know, so usually you hire a contractor that has an excavator, it's got a payment on that thing, and he wants to use it. And so that's kind of what we get. We don't have one. But we rent one if we need it. <laughs> so what we do is we uh, basically just cover the lawn with a weed-free material that has the right components of where of, for what you're trying to grow down the road. A, a big mulch. Yeah. Okay. Well, so the this is kind of kind of launch into another subject about hog fuel. Ooh. Everybody know what hog fuel is? Yeah. So, so how many hogs can you feed with hog fuel? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, hog fuel is a, it started out as a uh, hog burner, which is, they, they had, they used all the waste wood back in the day to fire the uh, wood mills and create steam to run all the equipment. So they had a kind of a conveyor belt that went into an incinerator that they blew air into to make high temperature and uh, it was called a hog burner and the guy that invented it was named Hodge. So it was a Hodge burner. But then everybody started calling it, um, <coughs> and now and then so then the yeah and so that the wood they burned in there was the hog fuel. Well, hog fuel is this big moniker that can be almost anything. Um, these uh you know like RDS and other dumps, they can grind construction debris, painted material, treated wood, um, some, some roofing. You know there's a certain amount of inorganic or construction material they're allowed to have in hog fuel and still burn it and still haul it off to your site. Um, but there are some pur purveyors of hog fuel that actually only have land clearing debris and then you can get that product that has no or very, very little garbage or um, any kind of treated wood or anything that could be toxic. Um, and that's what I recommend. So if somebody's selling you hog fuel, you almost need to go see the parent material. And what they do is they have a huge, you know, huge, I can't even, like an acre, an acre across and maybe like, like 100 feet tall pile of wood stumps and rock and, uh, you know, needles and leaves and branches and they put it in a big grinder and they grind it up so it actually looks all shredded. It has all, all the particle sizes in it because it actually has the soil, rock, everything right up to big chunks. Um, and then they, uh, some of them, the ones I use, they actually run it through a screen. So they take out the really big chunks that may not look good in a landscape, you know. And then they take the rest of it and they put it in a two or three thousand cubic yard pile and they age it for a year or two so that all the weeds are gone. But what you have is what I call, it's called immature forest stuff because it's everything that's in the forest it just hasn't been there forever. And it's completely weed free at this point too. So that's what we use, and so we'll, we would treat the edges of the, uh, so wherever you have your lawn that goes into a sidewalk or a driveway, if you've ever done much sheet mulching, then that's where the grass wants to poke back up. Yeah. So we dig all that out in a, at an angle to the concrete, maybe like six or eight inches deep. We take all that sod and use it for future um, topography in the landscape, and then we bring in the cardboard and we actually walk the cardboard into that trench we built around the, around the edge and then we compress hog fuel into those edges and then we just spread it around the rest of the project um, and we, we cardboard over the sod mounds that we've created and then um, so we leave most of the lawn in place except for the areas that we don't want to have to dig up later, dig up grass later and we try not to haul anything off the site we try to use it all in place. And then we bring in the cardboard, and then we if we can, we have the truck dump right on the cardboard. 
Um, and depending on what look you're looking for, or what kind of, like, if you want to have a vegetable garden, I wouldn't use hog kill because it's wood-based, and you want more an algae-based soil for vegetables and for other herbaceous plants like that. But if you want woody plants, like natives, like kinnikinick and salal and rhodes and salmonberry and trees, and, you know, spirea densiflora and all the cool, you know, smaller shrubs, the hog kill is ideal. And after the first year, you'll dig in there and you'll see strands of mycorrhizae and everything that's already in the forest. And oftentimes, chanterelles and morels the first year, too. So the, the uh, place I've been getting my hot fuel is called Lens. It's down in Sandwood. And they'll deliver up here, too. Nice. L-E-N-Z. And ask for Jeff Keller and tell him I sent you. <laughs> um, but they have a product that is... They have a really rough, kind of straight hog fuel, and they have something else that's called wood chip mulch, which is kind of my standby, because it has the big chunks and all the fines. And then they have another one that's almost like soil. And the beauty of this stuff is it doesn't look like bark all brown. It's actually black. So it really looks like a landscape when you're done instead of a hodgepodge. And, uh, and then the trick is, you know, Treating the edges of trails and everything with the, with edging, it's kind of like if you paint a house and it looks okay, but then once you paint the trim, it looks tight and clean. It's the same with landscaping. So that, I think that's really where a lot of it's lost is if you have a wood chip trail, like a cedar chip trail within a hog fuel field uh, in your in your recently removed lawn, and there isn't a nice tight border between the trail and the garden. That's kind of where it looks more like a restoration or a landscape. Thank you. Yes. It was causing me great anxiety that the spring garden was causing an even bigger carbon footprint. So. We just did a really nice one with, with Sue Taylor. It was her design um, up on Brownsville Road. Um, and uh, it'll probably be on the floor here shortly. Yes? Where's the hospital? Uh, it's in Stanwood at oh. Lens Enterprises. Lens, L E N Z. Yes. Yeah. What was his name again? Jeff Keller. <laughs> and it's a small family owned business that, um, I mean, I have, I have so many nightmares about a hog tool. Our, the first big restoration project or wetland mitigation project I did, the client thought, hey, we got all this free hog fuel. And I was like, oh, great. And it had, had very bad access. And so these, you know, semi trucks with live, beds that just kind of push it out on a conveyor out the semi. He's, they're dropping semi trucks of this stuff and all over this hillside into this wetland. And I mean, it smells exactly like the dump. Like it is just full of garbage, full of plastic. Full of, uh, and of course it was free because they couldn't get rid of it anywhere. And uh, then they had to get a, a bobcat and distributed all this stuff in a wetland. So that, that was a, a legal mitigation that had 10 years of performance standards and monitoring that had to happen before the Department of Ecology would sign off on it. We had to replant those areas that they drove over with the bobcat like four or five times. And, and uh, you know, I mean, the garbage was blowing around and everything. Anyway, so beware of free hog fuel. And, and make sure you know what the parent material is too because the other thing that could happen is like, uh, if you had some toxic waste, you know, theoretically, and uh, you didn't want to pay for a permanent disposal, and you could mix it into something, which was happening in industrial scales in eastern Washington and all that way. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, let's say cutting oil from a metal operation has a fertilizer component in it, and they could, they've been busted for just renaming it and putting it into the fertilizer stream for industrial use. So it's really, it's it's scary, like, you really want to know what's in here. I mean, um, remember the Smith's compost yeah. deal? Does everybody understand what happened at that one? No. Okay. No. So there was a very reputable compost company that um, everybody loved their material. Um, and they used a lot of cow humor in it. And the cows were eating grass that had an herbicide in it that didn't get broken down by all the stomachs of the cow. And, and it was... And the neighbors over spray them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So 
you know, everybody's just buying their normal compost as they do every year, and next thing you know, everybody's noticing these like stunted growth of their vegetables and, and even everything. And it turned out that that had made it through the whole life cycle and was now being spread all over the county. People were paying to have their. How were they cows? It just went through the cows. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't get broken down. So be aware of anything you're bringing on your site. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty freaked out about it. <laughs> People are, are bringing in hay for their animals from the east side. Mm -hmm. um, how do we know that that's clean of the, the uh, I don't know. Does anybody know? How do you trust the hay and the straw coming from the east side? But they're still using it over there. Yeah, I don't know. That's a really good question. Well, it's a it's a it's a big and growing problem, I, I believe. Where do we get cleaned up? Lens. Um, uh, Green Earth Technologies is pretty good. Uh, Green Earth Technology in Linden. They are a uh, municipal compost operation, and they are um, really good. Like, for instance, if you're doing a rain garden and you have an engineer that told you you have to have a certain kind of soil mix. They'll mix it for you, I'll bring it. Like exactly what you want. But you don't know what's in their compost. Because yeah. it, it fishes one day and something else the next. Yeah, it's pharmaceuticals. Okay. Yeah. It has to dress them. Yeah. But it was, they inspect the loads. Yeah. It's kind of buyer beware in that world. And I would, um, so I'm bringing this to other people's properties. And so I am super, super conscious of what I bring up. And, uh, it's, and it changes all the time, too. So it's, it's, it's hard. Do you have QSD to grow? Uh, no. <laughs> Don't they have to follow up tests to be yeah. packaged and sold? And yes. Um, it's tested periodically, and I don't really know what the protocols are for that. But, I mean, we're talking, you know, like 10,000 cubic yard pots and a couple grams of testing. Yeah. So, and, you know, I don't know when they used to test George Pacific's air stacks and stuff, they got six weeks notice, you know? Yeah. So, oh. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a riparian restoration that my neighbors are doing. Mm -hmm. And the federal government and, well, the Fisheries and Cancer has a nursery for feeding a lot of plants. Okay. But they could really care less. The specifications could be all birds and seeds, okay, plants that will give you 700 trees. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to put variety in. I'm helping them do that. Mm -hmm. But it's under water now. Hmm. And I've seen a, a problem places wet soil in which I didn't think this stuff would really survive some of the flooding that I've seen. We didn't realize how we need the plants to get mature before we can handle this situation. But it's been dug and burned, and there's a big pond that comes out of the creek. It's a riparian zone of the creek. And um, I've already put the order together. So what can you recommend to some water lovers that aren't, when they're heroic, I'm going to have to maybe emergency contract to get some of those out of the list. But we want some evergreen huckleberry, you know, for producing. We've got a lot of sandberry, which I think can handle this, but. Evergreen huckleberry is a well green structure first, like a bunch of willow groves. And 
the stuff that will require, and, and, and start to get your structure in, and then add the diversity later, potentially. Um, sometimes that never happens, but it'll come in later on its own, too. What about planting in the spring? Would that help? Uh, it can. Um, yeah. Some spring planting. We've done, we've done planting underwater, and the way we did it was we had a bunch of bamboo stakes. And you basically put on your hip waders and your long gloves you get at Harbor Sales and come over your shoulder. And then uh, you have your plants and planting bags and you take up whatever you've got. Um, in this case, it was a long bladed shovel with a long handle. And you work it into the ground and you follow the shovel blade and put your plant in and then you tamp it with your feet and then you put a, 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 a bamboo stake so you know where you've been. Yeah. And it's underwater. <laughs> yeah. it's underwater. Completely underwater. Well, yeah. my red twig, you know, uh, whips. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're going to do that with Oh, that's easy, yeah. But yeah. eventually, I'm kind of thinking that you could just add some nice things in later. Yeah. Which, you know, that has a bit of character. He doesn't want bush bats either. So, so, so sometimes it's nice to do the, um, to do islands of the bigger stuff, mm -hmm. you know, for the first year. Like groupings of the trees. Yeah. yeah and then, nice. yeah, and, then, and just kind of get the structure in as fast as you can. And things that you like, like live stakes are pretty easy to put in open water, and they do well. Up high, and then, um, which is always exposed right now. That's fine. They'll do fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking the water part is kind of bigger, they're sort of on big sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can plant almost all winter. So when you know when we get some cold weather and the, and things dry out a little bit, you know as long as the air temperature general rule of thumb as long as the air temperature is above freezing and uh, the you know there's not too thick of an ice layer, you can, you can plant in those conditions. Well, they they so worked out. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, but we're about five minutes from our break for lunch. Okay. Uh, so I just want to remind, to remind everybody to fill out the evaluation form and then maybe uh, you can do it afterwards. Sure. Yeah. Okay. No so, uh, five minutes. Okay. We have five minutes. Four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you're talking about making borders to make it, you know, to finish the work. Um, yeah, so the question is, um, what kind of borders do I use in the landscape? Um, one of my favorite things to use is steel um, I use, so if it's, a, if it's flat or if it's, a, if it's got a constant grade, I use 20 foot long pieces of 4 inch wide steel by 8 of an inch thick. At Carlson Steel or Morse Steel or Z Recyclers, they all have it. Um, and then I make, then I get a quarter inch round rod and I bend it into staples. So the edging is like this, and then it's stapled like that every four or five feet, and then you can overlap them to join them together. And the nice thing about them is uh, they rust a little bit, and then they rust very slowly once they get a patina of rust. Um, they're not plastic. And they're called steel. Uh, just a uh, flat stock, quarter of an eighth inch by four inch. And they're about 30 bucks for 20 feet. But if you've ever put in the plastic edging and had it do this on you, and you have to dig it in very deal with this stuff, you can almost just make a shovel slit and tap it in place. And the beauty of it is, is it makes these awesome curves. And they're not, and so you can bend it, but you have to be careful because you'll kink it really easily, you know? Um, and I've done it where we have like 90 degree, and then if you have, Areas that are undulating a little bit, sometimes you have to use a little bit thicker metal so that it's deep enough for the deep areas, you know, and then, and then you don't see as much where, where it undulates. Um, I also use rocks. So sometimes we'll use like a piece of, um, a piece of wood, like a, a round cedar branch that's four or six feet, or so four or six inches thick, so it has some, you know, definition. And then end that at a rock and then start the middle edging from there. And you just kind of, and then and then maybe it ends into a tree or a plant or another bigger rock. And uh, mostly for paths, we'll use that. And then I've also used it to build up uh, kind of uh, what do they call those lines, uh, topo lines. Contour. Yeah, contour lines up hills. So you'll we just we just did one of those right on State Street actually on the corner of no Forest Street and uh, Chestnut at a doctor's office.
More questions? Yeah. So you mean that like for like privy to be able to hold us? Yeah, it's very elegant. Yeah. Yes. And then like, you know, strawberry or knick knick or whatever you use it goes right over it too often. Any more questions? Yes. I just wonder if you would um, if you would talk about the quick talk about the um, difference between seed burn plants and propagated and if they're propagated in cell culture, are they going to be genetically identical? Is that Yes. So it's a good question. You know, like uh, there's there are a few kinds of kinikinik, for instance. Um, the Massachusetts doesn't get the aphids. When you see the kinikinik leaves that are kind of all puffed out looking, that's an aphid issue. And so people like the kinikinik variety from Massachusetts because it doesn't get aphids here, but it's not really native here, but it looks just like it functions. So we don't know where these tissue culture plants are coming from. I mean, it could be south of Washington, it could be California. Could be man on hand, you know, and uh, that is one thing that's very nice about the seed raised stuff is almost all the growers that are raising plants from seed. When we sell them seed, we'll sell them Thurston County, uh, Indian Plum, Jefferson County, Skagit County. They grow it separately, and oftentimes in their catalog, you can say, "Oh, well, I want the closest stuff." And it was pioneered that way with Conkers because they found that they get uh, increased growth for the for the timber when they get the right genetics. And um, we were kind of the first company that started to do, you know, just separate the seed out. And then the growers started doing it because sometimes they'll have a contract that they want to provide plants for, and the contract will say, must be from within 50 miles. And they can, so now they have a unique product that nobody else can even compete with. The Plant Society has some kind of plant that seeds sale with the location. Nice. So if, if you go to Native Plant Society, seed sale, it'll say $2 package, 14 available, Thurston County. Yeah, awesome. And that, I think that's, and that is, you know, like, when I first started doing this, you could get Red Osher Dogwood from a company in Montana, Lawyer's Nursery, for half the price of everything else around here. And Sure enough, all the commercial guys were like, yeah, give me that. And so, you know, now we have Montana genetics. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we don't know. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, just, it's really now just starting to be kind of considered more. Are there to the seed Well, the other problem in the industry is that people tend to, like, uh, there are nurseries out there that'll say, I'll give you 75 cents for every small sort of fern you give me. And so they're going into the DNR lands, and they're collecting a thousand or two thousand small ferns a day. And yeah, so um, trillium is another one. Like when I buy trillium for my nursery, I only buy stuff that's grown from seed because people are, you know, doing they're stealing that from the woods too. So if you can buy a plant that's grown from seed, then you're probably supporting a really small mom pond nursery or at least a good regional nursery. And uh, yeah. I don't know what to say about that. I think we're actually over time. But, um, I want to thank you for all your great questions. <laughs> if you need any help, please feel free to call or email or stop in the nursery and say hi. And, um, keep up good work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we get started. Yeah.
Regulatory Land and Use Management and Watershed Studies for over 30 years. Mr. David Roberts specializes in seeking innovative solutions to today's challenging community and environmental resources. He has worked in, the wide, in a wide range of settings and a variety of projects here in the Northwest. Some of his specialties include stormwater compliance, site assessments, mitigation and restoration plans, shoreline management, watershed and conservation planning, water quality studies, environmental education, and most of all, public involvement. He is a graduate of the University of Washington and Washington State University, and has been a world traveler, including some of the Scandinavian countries and Australia. Please give me a warm welcome for Mr. David Roberts. Thank you, I appreciate the fact that you would rather come hear me than rats and bats. <laughs> So I'd like to um, share with you the experience. I had a great opportunity to um, participate in uh, in the Lake Patton area. Does everybody know where Lake Patton is? Anybody <laughs> local around here? I saw someone from Island County earlier, so I thought maybe wouldn't know. Um, but obviously, uh, for those of you who do know, Lake Patton is a, a quite a special place. It's an amazing little um, park. Uh, in the south part of Bellingham, and uh, I'm going to share basically a story of what a group of people did there um, to um, raise some awareness. And so, um, I think I'm going to wander around with this. Do I need this? Can you come me without it? Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. So, in this presentation, I'm just going to go over with you um, what we did to build a team of people to work on a project together. Um, we'll go over the results of those studies. So, this is going to be people, science, and then kind of experience for a type of a discussion. And this whole um, is a, this is a great example, I believe, of where we took citizen activism. We applied some good science to it, and then we were able to actually um, uh, affect policy in our community. And this often, oftentimes you have citizen activism trying to work on policy, but you don't have good science. And that, this is why we felt we had kind of a unique situation. And the story began in, in a couple of different places, one of which was my son, Brian, on the top picture there. Uh, needed to do a senior culminating project for his high school graduation. And, you know, he came to me and said, Dad, you know, what should I do? I'm like, well, what are other kids doing? You know, these, to me it was like, a lot of the stuff they were doing was kind of flaky. And anybody could have done it, right? And so I said, well, what if you sample, did a water quality sampling program on Lake Patton for one full year? Well, it sounds like a lot of work, and it was. It was a tremendous amount of work for him. He had to be out there in some of the snottiest weather, like today, taking samples. He had to adhere to a schedule. He had to um, uh, work with other people to get samples in on time and, and the right kind of things. He had to follow some protocols. So there were a lot of wonderful learnings for him. And he did that. So during uh, the school year 2009-2010, he sampled every month had all the samples analyzed by uh, uh, Western Washington University. He got the data, created a report with a little bit of help, and got to go and speak to the mayor about it, specifically. So it was a great uh, experience for him. And he was able to highlight some basic water quality conditions. We didn't say whether they were good or bad, but at least he could show what happened with the seasons. Not long after that, um, we started to hear rumblings in our area of sort of South Bellingham and the county down there that there might be some changes in land use that were being considered by the county. Uh, we live just outside of the city in the um, South Hills neighborhood. And uh, the county was looking at, at uh, 
um, putting that into a, an urban growth area and trying to shuffle it off to the city. Well, there are a lot of issues around that. Primarily, if we do that, then isn't that going to cause the build out of that part of the, of the county, which happens to be mostly within the Lake Pad watershed? So, Betsy Gross, a uh, lady below here, many of you may know her. She's a long time activist in this area, involved in uh, uh, Audubon and a variety of other environmental causes. Um, she said, gee, you know, I'm kind of worried about where that's going. And she and I sat down together and she said, what if we did something to try and raise awareness about the lake? Because the potential of houses and development within the watershed might potentially impact the lake. And so we started to formulate a bunch of ideas about how we might um, work together. So we decided, look, let's, let's tackle this thing and see if we can get some science help and we can get some help from some volunteers. So we had to go out and say, gee, you know, we need some people to help us with this because we don't want it just to be one or two people. We want this to be a community action kind of thing. So we all contacted a bunch of folks that we thought were interested in Lake Patton. We met down at the lake. We had some discussions about what kind of work needed to happen. Um, these are all different things that we, we needed help to make this successful with. So we had to have people out on the ground, people in the lab. And we had to be able to do some research on a variety of things. Um, we needed to speak to policymakers. We needed a little bit of money to do the work that we needed to do. And so um, we got a, a bunch of that and we uh, together, and then we basically went out and we, before we started, we, we needed to have a sponsor because we weren't uh, uh, a nonprofit. So we went to NC, the New Exact Salmon Enhancement Association, and uh, they offered to sponsor us and kind of handle our money for us, which was really important. We had some donations and things from various people, and we needed to have a way to shuffle that through and, and manage that money. So they helped us with that. We went to the university and we said, hey, would you be willing to support us with a student and some uh, professorial oversight? And, uh, and so the Huxley College helped us with that. We also went to the city and the county ahead of time and we said, look, we're going to do this study. We don't want anything to surprise you when we get done. So we're going to tell you about the study we're going to do, and we're going to take your input into that study, and then we'll design it so when we get done, everybody will know what we were going to get, right? And how we were going to get it. Excuse me, what is Point, point Post Lab? Post Point Lab, that, that's the, Post Point is the sewer treatment plant, oh. and we'll get into the details of it uh, later, but they provided um, lab services and mm -hmm. assistance. That's great spend. Don't call a sewage treatment called a lab. <laughs> <laughs> well, that just happens to be where the city's laboratory is. Oh, is in the sewer treatment plant. Yeah. So. It's one of the <laughs> then we really needed a way to tell a story, so we set up a website and we put a place there where we could put our data, we could uh, announce meetings that were happening, all that kind of stuff, and just get gen people generally um, excited about uh, the work that we so, what happens here? All right. I'm going to see what, what pops up. Looks like these pop up. Um, so, we had basically some, some reasons for looking at Lake Patton in the first place. Those of us who walk it or run it regularly observe it during all different seasons. And, and um, one of the things that immediately stood out for us, and any of you who walked it, particularly around the uh, the west end of the lake where the outlet is, and in the fall, uh, we often get this fluorescent green algae bloom that comes in there. And it's kind of an unusual thing. I've been looking at lakes for 30 years, and I hardly ever see a lake that does that. But um, it is a characteristic of Lake Patton. It, um, it has a lot to do with nutrients and sunshine and wind direction and a bunch of things that, and uh, time of year. But we do get that algal bloom. So we started to think, well, what, what? That doesn't seem right, you know? So maybe that's a question we could look into. Um, a number of us have seen, as the picture in the upper right, a rapid growth of um, aquatic plants in the lake and um, some changes that are happening there, too. So we're 
thinking, well, what might be going on with that? Um, we also, um, some people said, well, gosh, I wonder if anybody's testing the lake for bacteria. We have a lot of people swimming in it. Uh, we have a dog park, uh, which just happens to be upstream of the lake. Um, and so we wondered, well, you know, I, I wonder how that's looking. We found out Department of Health doesn't sample swimming areas anymore. You know, they can't afford it. So uh, we thought, well, maybe we could look into that. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, uh, we decided, look, this might be a great opportunity for student involvement, young kids, college kids, that kind of thing. Why couldn't we bring that in to um, ensure that we get some, some good information? So, this is a little difficult to read, I'm sorry about that, but um, beautiful picture just the same from one part of the lake. Um, so what we wanted to know was, what's the condition of Lake Gadden right now? What are the factors that contribute to that current condition? Uh, how would changes in the watershed, specifically development, um, affect the lake? And then what needs to be done now and into the future to protect the lake? So those were the four questions that we set out to answer. And we worked on this process from um, uh, basically through late to, um, summer of 2011 through about spring of 2013. So here's an uh, air photo of the Lake Patton area, and it shows um, the sampling that we did. We'll go through each of these a little bit. Our main sampling sites were at the dock at the outlet, and the, dock, the fishing dock on the other end here. We also did fecal coliform at uh, this site on the lake initially, and then up through the stream that comes in here later on. We did a, a couple of times we sampled uh, in that deep part of the lake right there to see what was happening during the middle of the summer. There's some stratification that happens in the lake, and we wanted to know about dissolved oxygen during the, the hottest part of the summer. And then there was some algae sampling that was done uh, as well off of the um, swimming beach um, and then at our um, two other um, dock sampling sites. I'll go through each one of these projects, starting now with the lake sampling. We had, um, throughout the um, two year period we worked on this, we had two students, uh, Andrew and Laura were great. They were out there like, uh, every during the summertime it was every two weeks during the winter time it was every month uh, collecting samples and analyzing for all the nutrients and basic water quality parameters to indicate the health of the lake all the sample they ran all the samples in the WSU lab um, and then we paid the kids a, a stipend um, to do work so many interns at, at Western don't get paid and we try to make sure through our um, our contribution, we can pay the students for their work. And then uh, Dr. Matthews uh, oversaw the, um, the work that they were doing. And we won't have to get into all the, the details here, but I mentioned the sampling that was done, the profiles that we did, and the uh, analysis work that was happened there. So just now we'll switch to data for a little bit here. Um, the two main indicators out of this study were around phosphorus. Uh, and uh, in general, when you look at, at lakes, either from a eutrophication standpoint, that's how, how uh, rich the lake is and how much it's growing in algae, um, at anything over 20 micrograms of phosphorus tells you that things are, are getting pretty soupy. Uh, it's not bad, but it, it's sort of what the uh, State Department uh, of mm -hmm. Ecology and their water quality standards calls an action level. So when you get over 20 micrograms, you should be looking at the watershed, you should be looking at the inputs of phosphorus that are coming into the lake. So we found in the, in the um, summer uh, sampling time period there in, um, in, excuse me, in the fall, when you see those soupy uh, green um, algal blooms, that's when there's a lot of phosphorus in the water column. And that's what we found later is that during the windy time periods, it mixes the lake up, it brings a whole bunch of phosphorus out of the bottom of the lake. Right when we have a beautiful autumn weather, 
and boom, it's ready to go for uh, an algae bloom. So that's pretty typical, it happens almost every year. We also used a, some more complex parameters that involve chlorophyll, and we found this same kind of thing. It, this is a trophic uh, index on this side here, and you can see that during that autumn time period, uh, the lake goes into a, a eutrophic kind of a state. So we look at this, we go, gosh, you know, we don't, we don't want to be pushing up in that direction because that becomes less and less clean water quality. We want to try and keep it into what's called this mesotrophic um, condition as long as possible. The, the things that typically drive that up are sources of phosphorus outside of the basin, so outside of the, the lake itself. So it's runoff in stormwater and, uh, and from the streams. So that was real quick summary of the, a lot of data, a lot of things we looked at in the lake um, in terms of what the college kids work on water quality. We also had some questions, in part because of that green algae that we see there, about what the <clears throat> composition of that algae is. Because certain types of blue-green algae can be toxic, especially to dogs and animals who might be drinking out of the lake. And so uh, a sort of a sub-study of this thing, which was sponsored by the city of Bellingham, uh, paid to have um, the uh, algae sampled throughout the summer and into the fall so that we can get an idea of what's going on. So there are lots of different algae in the lake. They come and go at different times under different conditions of nutrients and sun and all sorts of things. The key to it is that um, a lot of them are blue-green algae. Um, some of those produce toxins. However, there was no indication of any significant toxicity in the lake, even though we had a lot of those out. So we were able to answer two questions there. Yes, the lake is moving kind of in an entropic uh, condition, and one that we're, is not necessarily desirable. It does generate algae blooms, but those algae blooms don't appear to be toxic. So that was two, two questions about the health of the lake. Um, a third study that we did was, uh, didn't involve the, the college kids, but it did involve the Post Point Laboratory. Um, this was uh, uh, a fecal coliform study. And, you know, uh, fecal coliform is one of the, the, the bacteria that we worry about. It's an indicator that you might have other viruses and um, uh, uh, bacteria that are not good for our system out there. So it's just an indicator of things, usually animal, uh, so it's going to be sourced wild animals or domestic animals or human inputs to streams. So we sampled, as I showed you in the map, three different sites around the lake, and we kept getting data um, that uh, indicated one spot was different from the others. But uh, basically, there, there were primarily uh, five of us involved in the sampling process, uh, Betsy and I, um, Phil, who's uh, uh, one of the board members for NC, helped out. Uh, we had Carl and Edwina, they were both um, uh, had uh, careers in bacteriology, so they were our technical advisors on our sampling, and then Peg Wendling over here is the supervisor of the city's laboratory, and she amazingly made the whole laboratory available to us so we could bring samples in, we could, she taught us how to do all the, the testing that we needed to do, we ran it all, they did the quality assurance on it, and we got an amazing set of data out of that. Very cool. So um, we sampled, like I said, around the lake. Um, we identified in there, right near the, the um, ballpark, that we got significantly higher fecal coliform readings than we got elsewhere. So we um, basically decided, hey, you know, we need to go upstream and see what's going on. But before we did, here's what the data looks like here. Um, the, the red line, there's a red line here, this is the ballpark. The blue and the, uh, and the purple lines down here are the other lake sites. And you can see that they, the other two lake sites, the docks, there's hardly any, <coughs> hardly any uh, uh, coliforms in our 
sample, but we kept getting these spikes certain times a year. Uh, these are in the fall, as you can imagine, with high rainfalls that's washing off the soil and so forth down the creek right there. We got some blips a little bit later on in a big storm in the summertime here, and then the next fall, it went right through the roof. So um, after that one, we decided we're going to go and look at the stream itself. And this won't show you the data, but we were able to go out on the ground. This blue right here is the stream coming through. Here's the bathrooms, the dog park, the ball park right here. And we went up upstream here, took samples, came down, and then we sampled all along this section here. And it turned out there were a couple of culverts that came from this side of the trail, this is the trail, this side of the trail over to the creek. And we found water sheeted off of this area into that uh, a drain that ran right along here, and then hit those culverts and went right into the creek. So we had a combination of that. We had dogs that were clearly getting into the creek here. And we had people just not picking up the dog poop anywhere along this section of the trail. I think one day we had over 20 piles that were just draining into that ditch and then going into the creek. So we were able to collect this data and um, put it into a report. There the dogs run free. The dogs run free here. And at the time, it was supposed to be from this point out was supposed to be the, the, um, the uh, off-leash area. But many people just let their dogs out of the car right here. The first thing they do is poop right along the trail, and then they walk on because they're not on leash. They don't even see them. I know, I know. So that's the bulk of our water quality studies. But then remember, we had a question, well, what's happening in the watershed itself? And what kinds of things do we need to prepare for in the future? Um, so we had two phases of a watershed study. And the, um, the first of those, uh, and, and the two people that worked on this was uh, Chad Stellarin, who was a uh, geology major at, uh, up at Western. And his uh, supervisor is Tyson Waldo, who teaches uh, geographic information system classes up at Western. And they were just great to work with. So our first uh, part of this study was just to understand what is the setting that the lake watershed, the, the Lake Patton watershed um, has, and what are the characteristics of that. So we started out by just mapping some of the critical features. Um, and so on this map, we determined uh, that there's 1,789 acres in here. Of that, this whole chunk right here is the park itself. So that's 600 acres. Um, and then we mapped wetlands and streams, uh, steep and unstable slopes, and uh, open space areas to get a, a general characteristic of, of what's going on. So these streams have um, buffers on them, just to give you a sense of what the, the um, area of potential protection is in there. Then the, the purple areas are wetlands. The purple stripe is a, a standard buffer that we put around there. The brown areas are the steep or unstable slopes within the area. So this gave us a general sense of what the overall picture of the watershed looks like from an ecological standpoint. Then. Chad went through and digitized almost every inch of the 1,700 acres or whatever it was. Um, every house, he went around the roof of the house, he characterized the yard, the driveways, everything. It's a very detailed study. And then uh, what was forest, he considered forest. What was wetland, he brought the wetlands map forward. And so we were then able to say, well, this watershed right now is 69% forested, and 21% of it is impervious surface. So roofs, uh, I think we get roofs, and uh, driveways and streets, and grass areas of lawns. We consider those to be impervious, because most of the water in our grass areas goes off. It doesn't go in there. Then we started to look at where are the people
people living and how many houses are there. You'll see where this is going in a moment. But within the watershed, then we had 930 homes, which results in about a half a home per acre if they were spread out over the whole area. And I'll point out, because these will be referenced later, these lines here were established by the city for managing runoff. So these are essentially like sub-watersheds within here that collect water to different places in the city has to do that even though we're, this is the boundary of the city right here, this is county, the city. All the water goes into the city's stormwater system and they need to know well, how much water is going to be coming off of each one of those sub-watersheds because usually there's a pipe that goes under a road and they need to know how big that pipe is. So they had some wonderful maps that we were able to work with and then put all the houses on there, show where people are living. So that, that gave us a whole set of statistics about the, the watershed. Then we used some mathematical models that looked at different types of land use and said, how much phosphorus, remember now phosphorus is going to be the key thing in runoff that affects our water quality, how much phosphorus is likely to be generated off of the watershed, and then you'll see in a moment how we drilled right down to each one of those sub-watersheds as well. So before there were any houses in this watershed, if we assumed that it was all forested as the forested parts are today, um, it would have, there would have been about 172 pounds of phosphorus would have gone into, into the lake. The current uses um, result in an estimated 491 pounds per year, and then if we allowed a certain amount of build-out, and we'll show you the build-out scenario in a moment, it would result in another 3% uh, uh, increase. And we use the phosphorus estimates that are being used in the, for the protection of Lake Watman as the same thing for this area here, for the runoff rate. Is it the four at the bottom? Yeah, Eight pounds per year additional. That doesn't mean no, you're getting four ninety one to the five oh eight. That's right. It's an additional three percent increase. The brackets in the wrong place. There. Okay. Good catch. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so then we were able to go back and look at the the watershed from the standpoint of each of these um, sub watershed areas and predict for each one of them based on the largely the percentage of impervious surface, what the likely phosphorus generation is going to be in there. In, in this particular case, pounds per acre per year. So you can see here we have largely a natural um, uh, watershed, and the pounds per acre per year is relatively small. Um, my neighborhood right here, which is the most densely uh, populated area, has a relatively high um, uh, amount of phosphorus per acre per year coming from that just because we have a lot of concentrated uh, impervious surface. These areas over here are kind of an interesting situation. I color them white because this water all drains down to a pipe that comes into the creek right here and then flows directly down the creek. It only goes into the lake when there's enormous storms and there's an overflow for it. So these, this whole part of the watershed actually doesn't even, isn't hardly even counted in the, in the equation. Um, and so that's pounds per acre per year, but if you look at the next picture, I'm not hidden it. Anyway, we also calculated the pounds per watershed. So, and I just left that um, picture out of here. And that tells a different story because even though this pounds per acre per year is small here, it's a large area. So there's a lot of, a lot of phosphorus comes from here, and then it's spread more evenly around, around the other ones, depending on the combination of area and, and amount of runoff. So one, as I mentioned to you before, the county was looking at changing the urban growth area status and trying to get the city to accept a portion of this area into, um, into the city. And the area that they were interested in is this one that's outlined here. It's in the county. It had been historically an urban growth area. And for reference, here's U Street coming up right here. 
went back over the hill. Um, and so we wanted to look at uh, the concept that uh, there were developers, they wanted to develop some land, and we wanted to say, well, where would it make the most sense to put houses, and where would it not make sense to put houses? So remember the first map showed us all those sensitive areas, the streams, the wetlands, the steep slopes, and so forth. If you think about that in here, these yellow areas are a combination of areas that are already developed, plus all those what we call the sensitive areas. So we combine those areas together, and the remainder, when you pull those out, are the green areas. Those are the undeveloped areas, like that. So we decided to focus on this urban growth area and see, because the, the county was being pressured by developers to um, put this into the city and develop it out, we wanted to see just how much developable land was in there. So over the watershed as a whole, the um, green areas represent about 27%. So those areas that either are in park and sensitive areas are already developed. If the remainder of this watershed, 27%, could potentially be developed in that neighborhood's houses. So when we focused in on that urban growth area, you can see, like, you can see my neighborhood right here in the, in the uh, um, image underneath. And then you can see the area that is um, largely undeveloped in our area is, is this one right here and this big swath here, which due to the amazing Chuckanut geology in here is a whole series of folded landforms that basically are steep slopes, rocky top, wetland in the bottom, or in streams, and then the same thing, just repeats itself. Very difficult ground to build a neighborhood or a house or anything on, and yet the developers who own and were expecting to develop that property just looked at it as if it was the desktop. They didn't think about the fact that they had all these this complexity to the landscape or these sensitive systems. Well, if, if you look at the lake, which is down here, of course, this, this area is the single largest undeveloped area, and it happens to have the greatest amount of sensitive areas in it. And so our focus then became, okay, what do we do with that piece of property? What do we recommend um, for that? And as you can see here, there are places in the green here where people could do some form of development, but it, it's really pretty limited in there. And so what we basically did at that point was say, okay, we're going to go to our politicians and we're going to say, that area, if you want to develop it, the chances are the impact there are going to be impacts to Lake Padden. And if you want to develop it, then it has to be developed in a way that stormwater will not impact the lake. So overall, our study conclusion said that lake water quality is relatively stable, it's moderately good, but it is impacted by current uses, some of which are things that you might not think about. Um, fishermen who come and if you walk the lake, you see after fishing season, the, the shoreline is just beat to pieces. Right? And so there's erosion happening along those shoreline areas. That's contributing as well as the watershed. Um, the fact that the fishermen beat down the riparian area means we have more ducks and geese on the lake because they come up and feed on the grass. Where they should be out there feeding on the aquatic plants, now they're feeding on the grass. We have more ducks and geese probably than ever now. Um, Phosphorus and fecal coliform are um, still the most important uh, pollutants, particularly for fecal coliform over in the area of the ballpark. Um, but we have algae in the lake, but the toxic situation is good, and the current sources of phosphorus and fecal coliform can be reduced with better management. Um, and then finally, future declines can be prevented by um, making sure that those ecologically sensitive areas are um, protected. So now, step back from the results, and we'll talk about the 
outcomes and accomplishments. Now, this was an amazing time for all of us involved. We, we learned a, just a ton, not only about the lake and the sampling and analysis process and activism and so forth but, and, and reaching out to the community, but we also um, were successful in getting the county council to not move that UGA forward. They put it into a reserve status. Uh, it'll probably get looked at again in the future, but when the city ended up looking at those areas, they said there's not enough place to build new houses, to generate permit revenue, to make it worth our while at this time. So they basically, the city sent a letter back and said, we don't want it. The county said, are you sure? And, but then when we went to them with all our data, they said, you know, it doesn't make sense to move that forward right now. So we were, that was our single biggest success. Uh, we also, also went to the city and the county about what we thought were things that they should do to um, either uh, do a better job of protecting or protecting the future, um, things that, uh, that would cause decline in the lake. Um, and uh, the one big thing that we saw out of that was that they did change the off-leash, the point at which you're supposed to have your dogs off-leash further up the line. Um, I think that as a uh, up the, upstream, uh, I still see people doing what they've always done there, so I don't know that that's had a lot of impact. However, I know the dog, uh, the, uh, dog community there is working harder on making sure that uh, people don't leave bags of poop and everything around because it's been much cleaner than it was before. The issue with the dog park and the runoff is still there, uh, and we're um, thinking about going back and doing some more sampling now just to see if there's been any improvement in that at all. Uh, we had a 50-year uh, party for the park. Um, uh, we partnered with the city and put on a, a nice party to celebrate the 50th anniversary and used that as a way to educate people about um, the issues around the lake. Uh, we had an opportunity to do a variety of different uh, outreach things. We had uh, kids uh, uh, doing tabling events uh, down at the lake uh, during several different activities. We got some good news coverage um, and uh, kind of generally raised awareness about things. Our students had huge uh, opportunities in terms of their internship to learn and practice uh, and get that experience out on the ground. And, and our relationship both with the university and the city and the county was excellent. When we got through, they knew what the study was about, they paid for part of the study in the case of the city, and we got something that everybody could live with when we got done. Now, the <clears throat> lessons learned out of this was that uh, if you don't have a spark plug, um, things stop working right away. And, um, and dear Betsy's uh, husband has not been well and she had to withdraw from, from our process. So as, a, as an ongoing effort, we are kind of sleepy right now. We're out there still and in the right conditions we might reactivate again, but that is hard. It's hard to sustain the interest of people uh, over more than a couple of years on any effort anyway. We still have our website, we have our reports, an interest in what's going on, but it, uh, it's hard to keep something like this going. We did reach a point where we answered the questions we wanted to answer, but we also know that there's a lot more questions, and, and in many ways, Lake Patton could be like a, a laboratory for the university, and we could, with the right funding, either through foundation or whatever, we could continue to do all sorts of studies around the lake that are socioeconomic, we could look at at recreation issues, we look at more water quality things, because basically we did modeling and we did a, a very small amount of sampling. We didn't look at the input from the streams or anything, so there's a whole bunch of water quality work that could still go on there. And then of course, you know, you don't always get what you ask for. So we went to the city, we brought our results, talked to the parks department, the public works department, we went to the county, same way, and they were like, okay, Things and didn't really take a lot of what we gave them. We were very specific, very thoughtful about not overreaching with our results. And, um, and so for some of us, that was a bit of a disappointment uh, that after putting all this work in and everything, and it, a lot of it's 
who's managing those departments and other parts. It's just, well, this is just not something they can do. So, um, and there wasn't, afterwards, there wasn't all that great of communication back with us about why not. And that was, has been a little bit disappointing too. It's almost like, well, as the activist, you have to go in and kind of poke them in the side and say, hey, you know, we gave you that report over a year ago. What have we done with it? So, so those are basic lessons learned. And, and uh, that's my story. We've got uh, plenty of time for questions or uh, whatever it is. Sorry, I'm just triggered by this. Um, was there, has the city ever expressed any concern about not testing the water quality or many people in the community use that as a primary swimming trying to facility? It seems to be like hear no evil and see no evil. Um, it's normally done by the county. The county is in charge of the um, of sampling. Um, used to be that they regularly sampled swimming areas. And that was one of the shocking things for us, was that we, we thought we were supplementing their studies, and we come to find out they weren't doing anything at all. So, um, yeah, it's kind of weird to think about, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, could, I can address that. Sure. Um, I used to work at the county, county mm -hmm. department, did some work on uh, water recreation illnesses, all with oh. uh, swimmer's itch. So yeah. awful. Yes, just I just had it. Yeah. All the way to some uh, Hawaii, uh, Norton Myers, etc. And despite everything, we have relatively good yeah. swimming areas. So when you're faced between, you know, the decisions you have to make between uh, better, uh, shaken baby syndrome and methamphetamines, you've got to make choices. That doesn't mean roll over and die. Express your concern and uh, see what can be done by way of fundraising. Well, but with one, when one, it's difficult times, as we all know, something's got to give. And, and there are no. They, they want they want to test on, but they have to make a choice. Yeah, that's difficult. Thanks for mentioning that. Sure. I appreciate that. So I, I would all say that I think even though know, people swim there, I don't think they consider that they have an official swim there. In right there, what the dressing rooms are. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm not There's no life. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I could be wrong. I'm just saying that, that I mean, they, they may be looking to absolve themselves of that being. Yeah, well, they certainly took the lifeguards away in a year. Right, right. there's no lifeguards. There's no sign no, 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 there's no anything that says swim here, yeah. it stays in the city, except there's no lifeguards, et cetera, and staffing. And actually, I'm more concerned about the people who are swimming up by the ballpark. Oh, and one of the things we yeah. urge them to do is say, okay, this is going to be a place for dogs, but it's not going to be a place we suggest that you swim. Mm -hmm. But they didn't want to tackle that stigma of saying, well, this is a no swimming spot. Actually, so. it's far more complicated. You can't close areas because you lose recreational immunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is huge. So then the question is, why don't we go and clean up a mess upstream? Yeah. The other question that I had about water quality is that that water goes directly down the bay. And water quality in the bay has been a concern of the states and people and everybody else. Did any of those folks express interest in learning what the water quality of the eggs was? Um, we were coordinating with, it, it's almost like two different worlds, the people who studied the lake and the people who are interested in the stream, downstream, we, we tried to share with them our information so they're aware of what we did. Um, I didn't necessarily get anything back from them other than here's what our, our study results were looking like, so, yeah. Yes, I'm just wondering about, if we can imagine if this could work there, there could be a project set up to create a rain garden along the, the edge of the dog park and all the dog owners working on it. And then uh, I also want wonder with this, you mentioned the source of phosphorus, and I'm wondering if I could hear more about that, and then also uh, whether the Department of the Ecology's rule changes that are, that are coming up that are going to demand that stormwater be dealt with on site for, for future development, whether that um, figures into your, your top 
the lake up, it brings all that phosphorus rich water to the surface where there's that fall sunshine we get in October usually. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when the blooms start and then they last right through until early November. And usually when you see a green along the shoreline, that's just dead cells that, and, and plants that are blown up against the shoreline and it's all over at that point. Um, presumably, when you go from the swimming hole across to the rock, it's about 60 feet in right just before you get to the rock. That's the deepest part. And then off the bone ramp, it's about 40 feet. Yeah, it's a part of my question that it's all oxygenic and that
So, and you may have mentioned this because I walked in late, but the Master Gardeners for Whatcom partnered up last year with Ray Edwards and the Greenways program and created a, um, a handbook with photos about the native plants around the lake. So if you've gone around the lake on the main trail, you may see them. Um, oh. The Parks Department put up these nice little signs. So there's stations, right? Sure. right? It's also on the Lake Patton um, website. Uh, website. You can look at it there too. It's all electronic. There's nothing printed. And we have a printed copy in our office. So Ken Salzman, who's a master gardener, a photographer, and a, a lake neighbor, um, is the one who headed up that project. So I'm, I only mention it because I think there's room for expansion, and it was great to partner with the city on that. And, and maybe that's kind of a conduit to, uh, as a place to maybe host some more information or just make people more aware of the, the plants that are intact there. And I don't know if there's room for more planting along the lake shore, right? <laughs> I think the challenge on the lake shore is just yeah. the, the need no for access. People that's, that's just a waste of time. We've looked at lots of different ideas of, you know, basically community conversations that we can have around the lake. And one of the things that pops up is that if it wasn't for a fishing season that we have on the lake and a first day, we wouldn't have the intensity of impact that we have there today. It's mm -hmm. that those first three days or so, a fishing season that clobber that shoreline more than anything else and then it tries to recover um, throughout the rest of the year and so you know one possibility was you say well we have asked fish the department of fish and wildlife to make it open for fishing all year round and you know somebody dumps in the fish once a year and nobody knows when it goes in and you don't have that frenzy but that would take away the cultural aspect of the first day of fishing right so people would fight that i'm, I'm quite sure the other possibility is um, a little bit more expensive, but would be to put some uh, fishing piers, additional fishing piers, or put them out farther into the lake, um, put more of a T-shaped pier so it isn't just like one little place where two or three people can fish, but a place where we can, you know, have people with uh, wheelchairs and things be able to get out there. And, uh, we've seen that at a, a number of different lakes where it's a great place, it becomes a, you know, a family place to go and plenty of room for everybody. And that would take the pressure off the shoreline. But if you could get that that shoreline restored, I'm sure that it would do two things. One would be the erosion, reduce the erosion, and the second thing would be that it would keep the birds who are supposed to be diving and dabbling out in the lake, not up feeding on the lawn. Was anyone able to characterize Lake Patton as a typical? in similar settings or, or better or worse than others? I, mean. I love that question. <laughs> and that's exactly what we asked Dr. Matthews. And she said, well, just like every person is different, every lake is different. The dynamics of the watershed are different. The um, response to seasonal changes are different. And um, she said, there is no typical out there. And she, she showed us things. She said, well, here's a lake, same size, same depth, completely different characteristics to it. Yeah, it's really not something that you can, can do. And I hadn't really come to appreciate that until I saw it, just how different this one is. Yes. Well, if there aren't any more questions, thank you very much. Thank you.